Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. My name is Henry Smith. I'm here with Dr. Scott Stripling, archaeologist, president of ABR, Scott Lancer. Today we are doing episode three of our roundtable discussion on the Mount Ebal curse tablet. Now at the end of the last episode, we unveiled the, uh, the, the writing from the inscription itself on side of, inside of the tablet and what it says, revealing the name of Yahweh, the sacred name of God, mm -hmm. Exodus 3.14 and so on, over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. Now, uh, Scott, uh, people are thinking about this, so you have the, an obvious question yes. for our, uh, our, our friend here, Scott. So I'm going to turn it yes. over to you. Yes, uh, Scott. Um, there are obvious ramifications from this discovery. Uh, um, one of the things that, that uh, struck me right away is that this is going to really rattle some of the assumptions that have been made over the years, uh, paradigms we call them. Uh, let's talk about these ramifications. Well, they are. I mean, the, the, the stakes are high on this, and you can just start with the first line of the, the inscription. Cursed are you by the God Yahweh, or Yahu, yod heh mm -hmm. because we have El, God there is El, and right next to it is Yahweh. Supposedly, these don't exist at the same time, and this is what in many seminaries uh, professors have taught, what students have believed, and has caused a great deal of skepticism that the Bible is not redacted or written, whatever term you want to use, until the Persian or Hellenistic period, a thousand years after Moses would have lived, so we don't have any eyewitnesses. <clears throat> so you have this E source, and you have this J source, they're hundreds of years apart, we have them side by side in the same document that's dating to around 1400 BC. That mm -hmm. throws that theory out the window, which means much of modern biblical scholarship goes out the window as well. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the foundation upon which other beliefs have been built, those beliefs were built on an incorrect foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you, you got me thinking about like one of the classic arguments is Genesis 1 and 2, for example. <clears throat> so they, they will say, in Genesis 1, it's God. In right. Genesis 2, it says Yahweh. And they say these are separate documents written centuries apart yep. because the names are different. And of course, one of the simple answers to that has always been the use of El or Elohim is to demonstrate God's creative power. And in Genesis 2, it's narrowing in on the sixth day. It's the covenantal name of God because he's dealing interpersonally with Adam and Eve, right? So that's been one of the answers that we've given. But think about the implications just from this tablet because they say that God, El, and Yahweh are completely separated right. from one another. So that's just one example, right, Scott? I mean, right. I mean, there it is. So along those lines, <clears throat> I want you to share what a very distinguished professor said about the altar, now he's no longer alive, but he said something about the altar is very pertinent <laughs> to this discussion. Tell us about Larry Steger. Well, Larry Steger from, from Harvard was a, was a brilliant man and a, and a genius, sort of the dean of, of his uh, generation. But yeah, Steger with uh, great pomp and maybe hubris, I might say, said that if Zertal found an altar on Mount Eval, we, biblical scholars and archaeologists, must all go back to kindergarten. <laughs> in other words, I'm not buying this at all. Yeah. And others like Anson Rainey and Bill Deaver, sort of senior archaeologists and scholars, came along and echoed that. Very interesting how when a paradigm gets locked in, how resistant we are to change, even though the evidence turns out to be pretty clear, and now the majority of scholars do believe that this, this was an altar, or at least the likelihood is very great that it was an altar indeed. So uh, yeah, Larry, uh, Larry's since gone on, right. but um, I, as I said last night at our banquet, class is now in session. We're back in kindergarten. Yeah, yeah, it's really remarkable. I mean, Scott, we talk about this all the time. Maybe, maybe some comments from you uh, as, the, as the president of the ministry, the leader of the ministry, when you think about somebody saying something like that and, yeah. and the way we're trying to hold to biblical fidelity, uh, maybe a few comments from you on that. Yeah, well, uh, it's always been troubling uh, to me to see a paradigm that uh, permeates a whole uh, uh, the, the academic world, even among Christians, it's, it's influenced them greatly. And uh, for many, it's really, it's hurt them spiritually. It's, it's hurt their uh, academic 
understanding, but more importantly, it has spiritually impacted them. Because if you come away from, um, you know, from from being on the receiving end of, of such a paradigm that the Bible can't be trusted, or that uh, professors have the authority to speak judgment on the Bible and dismiss portions of the Bible, it, it's it's very very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, we would agree. And I, you know, our our goal here of our, of our ministry, we we want to do excellent archaeological work, but we understand that we're dealing with the sacred text of Scripture, the the speech of the Creator, and it needs to be treated with the most reverence. And we think about Moses. I mean, we, you, the three of us have had this conversation about Moses. I mean, what does Jesus say about Moses? Mm-hmm. You believe Ju- Moses, you believe me because he wrote of me. Well, and that's the big deal, isn't it? Did Moses write the Pentateuch? Isn't that the, the big question? And the three of us were at Messiah University just a couple of days ago, and the students were very uh, eager to tell us what their Bible professors were telling them on day one of the class that Moses didn't write the Pentateuch. So don't think that this is just some, you know, pie in the sky out there at the Ivy League they're talking about this. This is in the heartland. And so the ramifications are huge. Do we have a reliable biblical document? Yeah, and some of the questions that you've posed too, like, you know, the, at least part of the old hypothesis and really the implications of it was there wasn't an alphabet that had developed enough yet for Moses to even write, even if he was a real person, right? That was, mm-hmm. that's part of, part and parcel of this. Here we have clear development of an alphabet and the, the tablet is not the beginning of that point. It goes back several centuries, right? So you're going to show that in your academic paper. Uh, so the, in other words, if, you're sa- if we're making an argument as Christians, that Moses could have wrote and written the Pentateuch. Here's evidence outside the Bible that's consistent with that claim. That's we right. would say this tablet and the other evidence fits that argumentation, right? The idea that Moses and Joshua were illiterate when the Bible says that they read and wrote, and they wrote things so that people could read them. So that's an assumption of literacy that, that exists right there. So that has been an argument from silence that has been made. They, they were illiterate when there was no proof of them being illiterate. And now we have on a biblical side, from a time that the Bible says that the Hebrews were there, evidence of writing. So Adam Zertal, I think he's been vindicated really in death. Um, he had a lot of criticism in his lifetime that he courageously faced. The paradigm has now shifted the arc has moved toward veracity of his account, but Zertal was on record as saying, all, we're, all we need is an inscription. And, <laughs> and now we've got that inscription. Well, how, how, uh, how prescient is that statement? I wasn't aware of that, Scott. Thank you for sharing that. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth, where we're committed to the authority and the accuracy of the biblical text as God has given it to us over the ages. And we'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Watch Lighthouse TV wherever you go. Available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. Search Lighthouse TV online on your streaming device or go to our website, lighthousetv.org, for more information. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith, I'm your host, and we're here talking about ABR's greatest archaeological discovery in over 50 years of ministry, the Mount Ebal Curse tablet. Okay, Scott, you are up with the next question for Dr. Stripling. Scott, we, uh, we believe that this discovery uh, dates to the late Bronze II period, mm. but there's discussion on whether it's early or late mm. in that zone, if you will. Maybe we could talk about that. If it's at the end of LB2, around 1200, 1250 thereabouts, it's still hundreds of years older than the earliest example that we have right now of Hebrew writing. If it's from the beginning of LB2, which is what I believe it is and what Peter Vanderveen believes that it is, then it's even more. It's a couple hundred years more. 
So regardless of where you place it, and, and I'm pretty certain the script is far more consistent with uh, leaning toward LB1. In other words, it's at the end of the late Bronze Age one period. Um, so we use epigraphy, basically. So we're looking at inscriptions that have already been dated to, say, the 15th century, and that this script is identical to that script. So by the Iron Age one, that script has changed, it has developed. This script has not. So it fits that, that very nicely. So not only do we have the epigraphy, but we have the metallurgy that I mentioned earlier. And that, that metal, that, that lead, comes from Lavrion. We know that exports from the Aegean stopped around 1200. So that suggests that it's a date older than 1200. And then we have the archaeological context. You know, I, I laughed when I heard one, one critic after our press conference said, well, you know, this this got to be from a later time period. Listen, read Zertal's publication. You've only got two choices. You've got Late Bronze II and you've got Iron I. So either way, it's older than anything that's ever been found dating to that, that time period. So we have archaeological context, we have metallurgy, and then we have epigraphy. Now, we have other metrics we might be able to explore as well. For example, uh, some of the bones. If we can extract collagen from those bones, we can do carbon dating on them as well. Unfortunately, Zertal's own um, carbon material was lost. And uh, he had scarabs that were also part of the equation. And one of those scarabs he dated to the 15th century, one he dated to the 13th century, Thutmose the third, Ramesses the second. But subsequently, we've gone back with glyptic scholars like Dafne Bentor from the uh, Israel Museum in charge of their Egyptian collection. And, and Dafne is convinced that that Ramesses the second scarab is actually not a Ramesses the second scarab. It's also 15th century BC. So the, the scarabs indicate that, the metallurgy indicates that, the archaeological context indicates that, and the epigraphy indicates that. We're pretty confident about the date. Yeah, I always love the way we talk about, we've talked about this many, many times, and just to reemphasize, especially for, for new audience members who are just kind of tuning in, uh, this matrix of evidence. So you're not basing dating on just one thing, although pottery is, from this period, very reliable, but still you want to strengthen the case, you know, the, the uh, cord of three <coughs> strands, as it were, right, right. Scott? Well, we always um, want to triangulate if we can, yeah. at least. Yeah, yeah. and so, so what I hear you saying, too, is, is partly here what we do in archaeology, is we go back and look at the previous stuff to make sure that it's right. been analyzed correctly. T talk about that a little bit, because, uh, you know, a lot of people think things are settled in archaeology, and it's not that everything is not settled, but we do have to make sure that we're double and triple checking what seems to be a consensus about X, Y, or Z. Well, we all have to do that. I mean, even people to the far left of us, uh, even minimalists, they were the ones challenging the existing paradigms and saying, you know, we should downdate by a century and so forth. Well, there, that means that everything's fair game. We should always be examining our ideas and holding them up and engaging in an arena. So I think that's, that's good science, that's good scholarship that we do that. But if I could say a word about the pottery, <clears throat> we have done a deep dive on Zertal's pottery, and of course we recovered over 300 more diagnostic pieces uh, from the dump, along with other things like flints and blades and styluses and, and so forth. But in Zertal's own pottery, he has seven pieces that we have identified that only exist in the LB1B, LB2A horizon, that's around 1400 BC. They have disappeared from the ceramic repertoire by the 13th century. In other words, that how did pottery from the 15th century get there, get there from the lower level? Right, right. It right. Don't, no longer exists. And this is not open for debate, Henry. I'm talking about um, the pottery books that we all use because we have parallels from hundreds of sites, hundreds yes. of excavations. So we all agree that this pottery is from this time period. And I'm saying, and Abigail and I worked on this analysis uh, together, we're, we're saying that's what it dates to. So the pottery is a very strong argument also for the archaeological context that supports the epigraphic date. Now, the percentage of that pottery from the time of Joshua is not significant in terms of percentage, but the fact that it's there is significant. There's enough of it, 
And that's actually consistent with what you're, well, you said that's earlier right. about the, that the first uh, altar being Joshua's actual altar, mm. and then the later one being built over top of it to venerate it, which was much larger. Was and huge. was in use for a long time. Right, right. Okay. So it makes sense there's more pottery there. It's a pilgrimage site in the period of the judges. So it's, yeah. it has, there's a, a four-room house that's next to it. So it's a, there's a use at that time. Joshua's ceremony from the biblical account seems that it's a one-time event. So we don't expect to find a bunch of pottery there. I don't think we commented on, we got about a minute in this, this segment, is on the stones that Joshua used. You actually sat down. There's a picture of you sitting there. Right. Uh, just examining that small altar. It was very moving for you, but just talk about the stones a little bit as well. Well, they're all unhewn stones, field stones, as the Bible indicates that they must have been, both rectangular altar and round altar. And that, that round altar, the very top of it is, is visible. But Zeratah left a portion of it unexcavated. And in a perfect world, when politics allow in the future, we will be able to go back and to actually excavate the rest of that round altar. Excellent. Uncut stones, just as the law of Moses prescribed, the way it's described in the biblical text. How about that? Yeah. You know, we find what we find uh, matches what the biblical text records over and over and over again. And uh, no surprise to us, and hopefully our audience is encouraged by that. And one, one more thing Please. real quickly, Henry. The, the altar itself is filled with bones and ash. The bones are all from clean animals, kosher animals, and the tablet is from the altar. It comes from the east dump. So we'll follow up on this a, a bit more, but just yes. wanted to mention that it comes from the altar. Excellent. Excellent. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We're here with Dr. Stripling and uh, my colleague Scott Lancer talking about the Mount Ebal tablet. Please don't go away. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth, presented by Associates for Biblical Research. We're talking about the tablet that ABR discovered at Mount Ebal, the altar there that Joshua built and was venerated later that says, cursed by the God Yahweh, consistent with Deuteronomy chapter 28. All right, so uh, Scott, you are up with the next question. Yeah, yeah, uh, Scott, um, we have, I've seen, you know, the drawings of uh, where these dump piles were located mm. on Mount Ebal. Uh, Adam Sertal's group uh, had dug in the, in the old altar, the altar altar, and we know exactly where that pile was, and that is where we came, where we found the curse tablet. Uh, but, you know, people sometimes are speculating, well, you know, how, how did you really find it? How did it get mm. there? How do we know it's legitimate? Well, I have heard that, and it's, it's a, a, a fair question. We tracked the dumps because we took material from the east dump and the west dump. So we just tagged it E and W. And so the bag from which the tablet came was the E material from the east dump. And as Zertal's notes, that's the material that came from the altar. Now, the idea that someone, we were smart enough to forge something or to fake something is, is, is laughable, or that anybody else came along and, and put this in there, that they would be able to write in proto-alphabetic script <laughs> um, is just laughable. Um, any more than you or I would be able to write in Old English. Uh, a poem, you know, drop me in. I mean, I have a master's degree in English, so I, I couldn't come close to writing in, in Old English. You, could, you, could, you couldn't Google it. In other words, if you were, if you were right. forging this tablet, you wouldn't have access to that information. That, that script died out in history. That's right. Yeah. 
And, and, and who would know that we were going to be able to do tomographic scans? Right, and who would even know that we were going to be doing a project on Manny Ball so that yeah, they would go and, and plant it there, so which would mean we, we were the ones who did it, which is, of course, yeah. uh, laughable uh, on the surface. But, you know, I think you get all kinds of reactions when you get a, a discovery like this, and um, that, that's not altogether uh, surprising to me. But that script is, is an amazing script, and um, I think a lot of people are going to be studying that now that we know that it's a proto-Hebrew, proto-alphabetic script. Now, when you, when you uh, privileged us with sending us the pictures of some of these scans in the beginning before it went to the academic uh, article for publication, um, as I was looking at it, I mean, I could see it too, and I, I'm vaguely familiar with the proto-alphabetic script, not an expert or anything like that, but was able to see what you were seeing. But there was a part of me, because it was scans, mm -hmm. I thought, this isn't the same as like uh, a script that's like in a stela or like the Katefinom right. scrum. We're actually having an image of it. And I, I wondered, uh, when people see this, are they going to think, well, that looks like a shadow, are mm -hmm. you seeing ghosts? Uh, you you describe what happens on the other side of the scan mm. to sort of show that that's not the case. You explained that to me, and that made a lot of sense. So could you, could you do that? When I formed the collaborative team, which I was heading up, I, I wanted two epigraphers so that I had to have agreement from both of them. They're very different. One's European, one's Middle Eastern, Haifa University, Johannes Gutenberg University, Christian, Jew. I, I wanted them independently to arrive at the same conclusion. And then I would have to agree with what we saw also. And then of course we have our scientists in Prague that are having to say, we're, we're all seeing this. And so we were all seeing this, this same thing and how it came about. And I think that's, that's critical to the whole process. Now, on the, so one of the things that verified what you were seeing with your eyes was the backside, that you could see right. the, the indentations with the scan. Ex explain that because that, it wasn't that I didn't believe you guys, but it was like sort of the slam dunk in my own mind that if somebody thinks they're seeing ghosts or mm. shadows, that okay. ain't true. <clears throat> so we've got 48 letters. Some of them were just positive. That's an ox head. We don't have any doubt about that. Yes. Some of them that are not as clear because you're writing with a tiny stylus on this tiny malleable lead. Um, if it was a letter we weren't certain about, we went then to the back with our tomographic scans, which are very sensitive, to see if there were bulges. Is it reinforced that there are these lines that we think we're seeing? Because they're writing it with the, with the, with the stylus. That's it would, right. It would they're push impressing into, it. And the lead is soft. That's right. It's yeah. malleable, and sure enough, we have bulges on those questionable letters that reinforce what we thought we were seeing. Altogether, out of those 48 letters, we have four to eight letters that we're not 100% certain about, yeah. but those don't change the reading of it, okay? Right, 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 that's very good. And that's all part of, again, like <clears throat> going over it over and over and over again to, to see, to make sure that you've covered every, every single angle. So even my quote unquote skeptical questions you answered, I wasn't being skeptical, but I think it's important that we, that we cover those kind of things. Um, that we, that we think that through, that every, every angle of it is considered. Now, Scott, I, w I wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to ask um, about, uh, in, ter in terms of the script, talk a little bit just more about the parallels as we finish up this episode, mm. um, that these are well established. Because, you know, you can't just make this up. Oh, it's an ox head, it's an olive, therefore, you, you know, you're not, you're not making this up. So let's wrap up the show with that. We have the, the same form, take the ox head, morphing yeah. into an aleph. We have that at multiple sites where it has been called an aleph. By other scholars. By other scholars and other publications. Right, so right, what right. we do in our publication is we cite all of those parallels. You know, this, this resh or this he, this is what it was, it was called this in those other places too. Yes. <clears throat> now if I could just real briefly though talk about the implications for the dating of the Exodus and the, and the conquest. Um, this, this gets right to the very heart of that because if it does date to what it appears to date, that means that Joshua was there around 1400 BC which matches the biblical date for the Exodus and the conquest. Yes. And so that's just another level upon which 
this has ramifications. We, we call this a tsunami for Manibal because it's, it's impacting anthropologically and linguistically and archeologically and historically and all these different ways, yeah. our understanding of what life was like in biblical times. Excellent, excellent. Well, it is a tsunami, Scott, and we are so privileged by God to be part of yeah. it. And gentlemen, I'm privileged to be here with you. Uh, <coughs> friends, Episode three is wrapped up. We're gonna be moving to episode four. We have more to say about this tablet. We're gonna finish up, so please come back next week and check out episode four about the Mount Ebal Curse Tablet. Thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth.